Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, webinar on driving the future of sales operations with artificial intelligence or AI. Let me go through some quick housekeeping and then we can get started. So first of all, just to let, let the audience know, and we want to get you involved, there are two polling questions uh, that will uh, flex your brain power a little bit. Uh, we definitely encourage questions uh, during the webinar itself, and if timely, uh, I will either answer it if I'm presenting, or uh, Jack will will uh, will answer it, and I'll tee it that up with him and, and interrupt him for that part. Uh, but we also have a Q&A at the end. This webinar is also recorded and will be available for later consumption. We will send you a follow-up email with the link to the recording. So let me get started. Uh, let me introduce Jack. Uh, Jack Borland. Jack Borland leads the sales ops for uh, Walters Kluwer's legal and regulatory division, where he is responsible for developing technology strategies. Specifically, he's responsible for the Salesforce and Aptis implementations. Now, he has been involved with sales, sales operations, and account management for over 20 years with multiple large enterprises. Jack, welcome, and thank you for joining us. So my name is uh, Kingman Tang, and I'm responsible for the strategy and go-to-market for the Aptis AI solution. Let me quickly go through the agenda for today. So first of all, I'm going to level set with what is artificial intelligence? You know, why now? What does it mean to Aptis and to the broader community? And then Jack will talk through how he's streamlining and running a, a sales operation, a global sales operations organization, leveraging AI uh, through machine, both machine learning and through a virtual assistant to increase sales efficiency and to increase margins and revenue. And then we'll go through a demo, actually two demos, to see how that works. And then obviously we'll follow up with a, a Q&A session at the end. Awesome. So let's just get started here. So it should be a no surprise that AI or artificial intelligence is all around us. In fact, I don't think you could get away from the news. Even the mainstream uh, news media is covering AI and it's talked about, whether it's uh, Tesla with self-driving car ambitions, whether it's Google or Bing doing page ranking and search results, or Amazon and Netflix. Uh, with product movie recommendations. It's, you're, you're simply not able to get away from that. So yes, it's all around us, but let's quickly level set in terms of, of definitions. Now, you know, you can read this yourselves, but I think at the highest level, AI, uh, its goal is just to seek to be more human-like in behavior, and there's a bunch of software and algorithms to, to make that happen. Machine learning, which is a class of, of AI, is a bunch of algorithms that allows computers uh, and, or endows computers with the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So when I think about applied AI, when I think about AI, how do I make this practical? How do we make this practical in the B2B space? so that it can solve problems for businesses. Now benefits can be, it can definitely transform the decision making across many functional areas. It can unite the functional areas on your organization's goals. You can improve efficiency, accuracy, and profitability of your business. And it will allow your staff members to be more creative and to do strategic work. Now here's a fantastic quote from a survey that was done by Harvard Business Review back in April, uh, just a few months ago. It says that 60% of executives believe their future success depends on the successful implementation of AI. And the message here to me is that people are looking at it. People are, are, are starting to use it and embrace it. And really the undertone of that is, is you should be thinking about, if you're not 
thinking about it, you should think about it, and you should put a plan in place to, uh, to start down that road and start that journey. And that's interesting, Kingman. Um, we have a strategy at Walters Kluwer to be a data-driven company. And one of the things that we're doing is embedding AI directly into the product offerings that we're releasing to our customers. So, you know, we're definitely all in. We think this is going to be a, a requirement for solutions going forward that AI be embedded and make the users' lives easier by um, interacting with them rather than just passively serving up content, but actually recommending things to the people using the tools that we provide. That's great. You guys, you know, well, <laughs> that's why we have you on, Jack, so you guys can give a perspective on, on what's going on. And it's, and it's interesting that you mentioned data, right? So to me, why now? So artificial intelligence has been around for decades, literally over 50 years. So it's not a new thing, but data, along with a, a few other things, is, is really fueling uh, AI and and just just the explosion of AI. So there's uh, there's a factoid here that I put down: 44 zettabytes by 2020. This was a a study done by by IDC back in 2014. Maybe it's changed by now, but 44 zettabytes. I can't even get my head wrapped around that amount of data. And all of this is, is being helped by the Internet of Things, these tiny sensors or even large sensors that are uh, um, in our home, in our businesses, on, on vehicles, on aircraft, right? So all these connected things uh, are, are generating data. Now you couple that with cloud and storage, uh, it's, it's, it's abundant, it's cheap, it's readily available to us. And, and now data science, which is a, a, um, a, a discipline that people are embracing, and we can't even get enough of the data scientists, uh, those guys are, 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 and gals are available. And, and, uh, and couple that with, with open source algorithms. And, and now you got this perfect storm where data is leading the way with all of these other factors that, that are creating this, this gigantic tidal wave for, for AI. And let me bring this down a, a little bit to, to the quote to cash level and, and just kind of start teeing up Jack as, as we talk about some of the things that, that Walters Kluwer is doing. So in the uh, configure price quote realm, uh, we have something called quote scoring. And quote scoring is this ability to predict what the probability of winning a deal is. So let's say I'm a sales rep, I'm a seller, I'm an AE. And I'm starting to fill out my quote with all the necessary information. And then at the end, I, I get a score. And the score might be 60, 60%. And what I'm finding is, is that, that there are some hygiene, basic hygiene things that I, I didn't do. Maybe there was a field that I didn't fill out. Maybe I did not take a recommendation from the machine learning algorithm and I wasn't including best practices into the quote. So in order for me to, to raise that score, the, the machine is telling me there's a few things that I need to do. For example, maybe what I want to do is uh, the machine learning algorithm identify some cross-sell and upsell opportunity while I know that my customer that I came from wanted product X. Um, similar customers of, of that size and, and, and in that industry also bought uh, product Y and three of product Z, right? So, so those are, are machine learning algorithms that are being run based upon historical data. And at the same time, on the pricing side, uh, you know, what should my optimal discount level be? What should be the pricing, right? So what I will find out from the machine learning algorithm based upon the historical data is that it's recommending to me a, a, an appropriate level of, of discount. And you couple all of that, that makes it into the, the, the quote score itself. So let me also introduce uh, our, uh, the virtual assistant. A virtual assistant is a conversational interface. In this case, is a new UI. 
is a way to interact or interface with your data, whether it's your, your quote the cash process or your CRM process. And the way we think about our virtual assistant and our, or the name of our virtual assistant is Max, is that there's three core competencies that she provides. Uh, assist, guide, and coach. Assist is, is this notion of I know what I want to do on a day-to-day -day basis and I'm just asking her to help me uh, expedite the, the things that I need to get done. Uh, guiding is, is, is exactly that name, right? Like a wizard. Uh, Max can guide me step by step, walking me, hand holding me through a process that maybe I don't frequently uh, interact with and so I don't know uh, what, what the uh, exact process is or I don't remember the process itself. And then coaching. Coaching, whether it's, it's taken from, from rules that were written by, by your organization or machine learning insights, uh, it's providing a proactive uh, recommendation of what you should be doing next. And the one thing I do want to note here is that Max gets smarter with Aptus Machine Learning. So these are some of the competencies and more that can be uh, surfaced through Max herself. Okay, so let me shift gears and get the audience involved, right? What, what is the time horizon for your company to use AI? Um, is it we're really using it now and, and we're very, very forward leaning or are we looking at starting a project in the next 12 months, the next 12 to 24 months or it's simply not a priority for us or this is the reason why we're here at this, in this webinar, we don't understand what it can do to help us. So I'll, I'll give you guys a few minutes or a few seconds actually to, to start um, completing the survey. In the meantime, I think there was a question that came in asking about the, uh, the presentation itself. Yes, this, again, this is being recorded right now and uh, at the end of this presentation, give us a, a day or so, we will also send a follow-up email with a link to the presentation as well as the recording. Okay, so we're going to stop the presentation, and, I mean <laughs> stop the polling and let's see the, what the results will be. That's interesting that a right. uh, number of organizations have already adopted AI. Um, so it does show that, that what we saw in the, the Harvard Business Review uh, study was correct, which is that people are adopting it pretty quickly. Yes. This is awesome. So I encourage you guys to ask questions for those that have adopted it. Let's, let's share best practices with one another uh, through, through the question and answer time and as well as uh, the, the go to meeting uh, facility to ask questions. So with that, I am going to have you, Jack, jump right on in. Okay. So uh, first, just a little bit about Walters Kluwer. Uh, we're a global organization. We provide content, insight, and software with that content and insight embedded within it. Um, so you can think of the traditional publications that we might have offered, like Standard Federal Tax Reporter or um, uh, Redbox Redbook. Well, we're now taking that content and making it available online and uh, embedding software solutions to help organizations do compliance, legal, regulatory um, processes using that content. Uh, overall, we have 19,000 employees worldwide. We have clients in 183 countries, offices in 40 countries. And last year, we had 4.3 billion euros in revenue. Now, my operating unit is uh, legal and regulatory US. And so we deliver expert content and solutions in the areas of law, corporate compliance, health compliance, reimbursement, and legal education. Next slide, please. So um, our business case for artificial intelligence within the sales operations team was that we are supporting a large number of different sales divisions. So 
you think about the needs of someone who's selling into the legal market versus someone selling to the corporate compliance market versus someone selling to healthcare systems with health compliance markets. Um, we have a very large product catalog. We can have the same product showing up multiple times with different price points uh, or with slight variations of what the offering is based on the market that we're selling into. And we have a large amount of historical contract data. So we're keeping track of what customers were buying from us um, three years ago, two years ago, last year, this year, and making projections about what they will be buying from us in the future. And we're primarily a subscription business. So most of our, our customers are existing customers that we're attempting to serve the needs of. And we needed a way to help our sales reps find appropriate products to cross-sell. And that's hard when you have a very large product catalog. You've got a very broad um, span of responsibility for the reps in understanding the various product lines that we offer. Uh, and ultimately, cross-sell is going to lead to top-line growth, more sales. And it's also going to make the reps more efficient if we can help them find those appropriate products because we can automate the account research. So that gives the reps ultimately more face-to-face -face time with the customers rather than research time. Um, next slide, please. So what we have done is to implement uh, Aptus's machine learning artificial intelligence platform. And it was focused around giving the reps uh, product recommendations for cross-sell and upsell. It was a six-month development effort. Now, I actually saw Aptus's offering at the Aptus's user conference Accelerate last year and immediately sat down with the, the AI team within Aptus at the conference and said, this is something that we really need. We've, we've been thinking about predictive analytics, you know, what a customer might buy based on similar customers. Machine learning is the next step beyond that, which not only takes the predictions and serves them up, but also then learns from how well those predictions execute are executed against by the sales team to inform future predictions. And so that was very enticing to me. So it was a six-month development effort. We started in June. We ran through to September, and the plan was that we would actually have a pilot running by fourth quarter. Because we couldn't quite get to the pilot stage at that point, we put it on hold for Q4 because it's our largest selling season. And then we started up again January through March of 2017. Um, when we launched in April, we launched it at the national sales meeting, received a standing ovation from the sales team when we did, demonstrated it to them. We later sat down with each of the teams individually and walked them through the, the process. And their feedback, both on the UAT for the short list of people involved and on the the one-on-ones with the teams was that this absolutely saved them time. It provided them valid recommendations. It gave them the ability to act on customers' um, uh, opportunities without having to do the legwork of trying to dive into all of the customer's inventory and historical buying patterns and looking at all of the similar customers to try and figure out what would be an appropriate next thing to serve up to the customer. Uh, now, we're refreshing this data monthly. Uh, we've got it stored in an Azure a back-end database where the algorithms run, and then they provide recommendation uh, records, which are then consumed by our Salesforce system. And given the nature of the sales cycle, a monthly uh, refresh is, is not inappropriate for this data. Um, one of the things that I'm especially proud of is that we were recognized by Walters Kluwer globally for the Legal and Regulatory Enterprise Achievement and Excellence Action Award for, for 2017 for delivering this on this time frame and delivering such value. Now, we also see the, the product recommendation as a foundational layer to let us build out um, a white space analysis, territory planning, account planning, strategic initiative. Uh, because if you can get to where you can recommend what products are appropriate, 
you can then take it up to the next level of abstraction, which is where are the opportunities across all the accounts inside my organization. So with that, let me uh, take over control here and demonstrate the application. And so I'm in our test environment with a, a test account. And take a second to queue up on your side. Uh, the test account is morning, noon, and night. It is a notional uh, law firm with 51 to 100 attorneys. Uh, we have two different types of uh, selling territories. We have selling territories that are based on named accounts, in which case the rep owns all of the accounts within the organization. And we have selling territories based on geographical uh, locations. So in that case, if a company has an office in New York and an office in Chicago, there might be two different reps serving that company. And that's dependent on the, the organization size and how the organization buys. So if an, if an organization has a distributed um, uh, purchasing team, then we would sell to them geographically. If they have a centralized purchasing team, as many law firms do, then we would sell to them based on, on their, uh, their enterprise. So what we have on the Salesforce record is the basic account details, and then we have a section that is the product portfolio recommendations, where it identifies the cross-sell potential. If there are no recommendations for a given rep, they won't even see this section of the page. It won't appear for them. Um, when there are recommendations, it appears, and those recommendations are appropriate depending on the type of rep that is uh, approaching the account. And, and that's important because we can have Team A, which is selling a particular product line that has geographic responsibility, and we have Team B, which is selling a different product line that has um, named account enterprise responsibility. And the system understands who the rep is and what they can sell. So when we click the review recommendations, it pulls up uh, a recommendation that is appropriate either for the enterprise, if it's named accounts, or for the individual Salesforce account, if it's geographic. And it pulls up the product families that that sales rep can sell and shows them which product families are being recommended. In this case, um, a product family is the intellectual property around a set of products. So federal estate and gift tax report is one product family. And inside that product family, there are a number of products, in this case, seven. It's telling me that there's a high probability that that is a relevant set of uh, cross-sell uh, um, product recommendations to consider. Over to the right, it's giving us an identification of similar organizations. And in this case, it's similar enterprises because, again, this is an enterprise level account. Uh, it's saying that there's Barley Snyder, Rody Dickinson, Rogers Towers, who are all similar to this customer in terms of their buying patterns, in terms of their size, in terms of several other demographics about the organization. And in this case, it's telling you some of those factors. It's similar because they're legal professional. It's similar because of their law firm size, 51 to 100. Um, and then down below, it shows you the seven products that are in this uh, product family. Now, what it tells you is here's the product name. Here's the price book price. In the description, we actually have tiered pricing identified so that at a glance, the rep can understand if they're selling to a tier three account that they're going to be using a higher price than list. Um, it tells the, the rep what the status is for that particular product. Potential, which means that it could be added to a recommendation opportunity. Um, in sales which means there is an opportunity already in flight that includes that product. We haven't sold it to them yet, but we are already talking to them about it. So it's probably not something that you want to start another opportunity against. Or installed. Now, with high potential recommendations, we would not expect to see anything installed because we're recommending you can cross-sell into this area. On the left-hand side at the product family, 
the rep has the opportunity to provide feedback directly to the algorithm and to the data scientists by clicking on the feedback button. And they can identify that it adds value or that it does not add value. And in both cases, it's got a free text field to provide additional data. But if they're saying specifically this doesn't add value, uh, we're giving them a standard set of pick list uh, values so that they can clearly classify why this does not add value. And um, this information is going to be consumed by the machine learning algorithms and used to enhance the recommendations further. So for example, if the rep says, I do not sell this product, A, the machine learning would identify that and then block those from being presented uh, at a future step for that rep. But B, it would also kick out to my team to say, there's something wrong with product filtering. The rep is seeing something that they're not supposed to see. Um, we have a known issue where some of the products that are on our latest platform aren't sitting in the same product family as some of the products on, on some of our older platforms. So we're allowing the rep to categorize why this doesn't add value based on, on that factor. Um, and overall, this gives us a good way at the front end of the process to alert the system to why a recommendation does not add value. Now, going through, uh, if they took something like the federal banking law report, they could add the quick charts for Dodd-Frank, and they could add, say, the integrated library in. And we've now got a button up above that says create quote two products. If the rep's satisfied with what they've selected, they can move forward and create a quote, or they could take off one or both of the products. They can also go to other product families, like the business franchise guide, and add in um, another product. And now this is updated to show all three. Now at this point, the rep can click the create quote, and what will occur is that the system will create an opportunity, create a quote record, and open up the shopping cart for the rep, showing them precisely what they've added. And in doing that, it's making some assumptions, default assumptions, about what type of sale this is, what type of um, uh, variables that the the rep might want to put in, such as close date or the subscription date. So this will cycle for a second. And since it's in my test environment, it does take a, a minute to load. It's a much quicker in production. So, so Jack, I just wanted to echo the point that you had earlier about the the reps being able to give you feedback. So this is really, really important in machine learning. Um, I guess you could call this kind of reinforcement learning. So that uh, while the initial training set might give us a set of results, the actual users on the ground would be able to tell us if those results are, are, are useful. And it continues to refine the, the algorithm itself. Right. And, and the machine learning is set up specifically to uh, extract that information from the opportunities created because the quotes that are created, the, the opportunities created, carry with it the recommendation tag. But it's very important at the front end when the rep's making the decision of whether to take a recommendation or not to also capture that feedback. Because if you don't capture that feedback, you're missing the opportunity to fine tune based on the rep's eyeball evaluation of um, how valid the recommendation was. So having gotten into the shopping cart, and this is the classic shopping cart for some of you who, who might have the configure price quote uh, uh, application from Aptis installed, the rep just does a quick reprice. And at this point, it fires all the pricing rules. So based on who the customer is, who the rep is, um, it will associate the appropriate price for that customer um, to the product. And 
while the rep could adjust the pricing, at this point, you just have a target opportunity. This is something that you're about to talk to the customer about. You haven't started the conversation. There's no point for the rep to plug in any of the, the uh, promotion codes or discounts that they might do. So they just review it and finalize it. And now once that's done, it drops you back into the quote record where the rep can see that uh, what the quote has been set up as from a default perspective. This will take one more minute. And again, it's, it's very important that the recommendations be tracked so that the machine can learn from the actual execution that the rep has. So how they move the quote through the um, stage process, how they move the opportunity through the stage process, all that information is going to be fed back to the machine learning algorithms on the monthly loads. So in this case, they have a $17,000 target opportunity created and a quote. It's set with a contract date starting two months from today. It's one of the defaults that we have. And when they jump over to the opportunity, which is where our reps use the um, Salesforce reporting to manage their workload, you can see that in the next step, we've reminded the rep of all the defaults that we've set up for the system. So you've got to up update the opportunity's close date because it was identified as being two months from today. You should update this next step field. You should add a primary contact to the quote. You should confirm the sale type. In this case, the system that we're going to be selling out of is SAP, and the proposal has a sale type of SAP subscription regular and the start period and the end period, which again, we've defaulted down for the rep to November to October. Um, so this reminder helps the rep to understand what their next steps are. It also, for the manager of the rep, is a quick identifier of the reps created this recommendation. Um, and if the rep doesn't update it, then it's the manager's job to go back to the rep and ask them, all right, you need to take the next step. You need to plan when you're going to get in front of the customer and talk about these things. Um, you need to adjust all of these values. And one of the other uh, defaults is the opportunity name, where we're actually telling them that it's the machine intelligence recommended products that uh, created this opportunity. Now, with that, let's skip back over to the presentation and talk about you know where we're going with this. Um, so this was our initial target, which was to provide the reps with a cross-sell, upsell uh, opportunity and quote creation process. And the feedback from the reps, again, has been, you're saving me a, a significant number of clicks. You're giving me. Uh, an enormous amount of time back by doing the research for me and, and suggesting to me what I should recommend to my customers. That has value. Uh, the next step beyond that is actually to create a white space analysis tool that layers on top of this where we look at the accounts, we identify where they have investments, we identify where we think based on similar customers there are potential for additional investments, and then let the reps drill down from there to the product recommendation and, and create the opportunity and quote from there. In addition, we're working very hard right now on implementing Max. And the first step is a Max assistance with the opportunity and quote creation process. Again, one of the things that the rep said when they saw this was, if you could take the product recommendations and separate it from the opportunity quote creation, we could also use a, a very quick opportunity quote creation uh, application. And so we're working 
to build that out with Max right now, where the rep can just, walking out of a meeting, talk to their cell phone, their mobile device, and say, Max, create a quote for me with Jim. And Max would look at the rep's calendar and go, I see you just met with Jim Montgomery at Cargill. Is that who you want to create this with? Yes. And then it would assess who the rep is, what type of salesperson he is, assess what type of company the, the customer is, and it would make some default choices about a number of, of points, such as what type of sale is it, whether it's a one-off sale of a book or whether it's going to be a subscription, because those are typically handled by different teams. And, uh, you know, which ERP system is it that uh, that's going to be used because different sales teams use different ERP systems on our back end for fulfillment. So that's in process. And then in near term, we're looking at doing that max user guidance that Kingman talked about, where we can put together a series of different uh, not commonly used processes by the sales team and embed the training materials, embed the, the steps directly into Max. So for example, if they wanted to do an account name change, rather than trying to find uh, the link to the Lotus Notes database where they have to fill out a name change form, they can just click on Max, say, uh, have Max say, what do you want to do today? And say, I have a name change for an account. And then Max would walk them through the process. You have to find the the legal document from the customer that specifies a name change. You have to identify whether any accounts are staying with the old name and go and any going to the new name, whether they're all shifting. Um, and then take over the process of creating all the forms for the rep so that that data is captured and submitted with the rep just having an interaction with their mobile device. Uh, also near, near term, we're looking at how do we take the white space analysis and the opportunity analysis from the white space and use it to identify territory coverage recommendations uh, so that we can say there's this amount of opportunity with these accounts. This amount of opportunity requires this many headcount, and therefore we should take these territories and split them into these different territories. And then from there, we're going to um, some midterm objectives of taking our usage data and embedding it within our uh, Salesforce system and have that as an input for price optimization recommendations so that the system can look at not only who's buying the product, but how much they're using the product and make recommendations about the optimal price based on product usage to the rep at the point of renewal at the point of new sale. Um, we're also taking what was the, the demonstration that was provided at the Accelerate Conference last year on the best quote recommendations, which is basically when a sales rep creates a quote, having the system look at what the best sales reps do and making a recommendation of the best sales reps also do this when they're doing this type of sale. Do you want to do this as well? Um, and that might be selling a uh, support package. It might be doing a, an extra add-on sale or a cross-sell. And putting that right in front of the reps together with an identifier of what the impact for their compensation might be. So as guiding them to what we want their behavior to be with the carrot of this is what what's in it for you to get that done and lastly max coach where we take some of the standard uh, best practice steps that we have such as if you're going to move an opportunity from one stage to the next if you have certain things that you have to identify that the customer has done such as they've identified for you the the buying process they've identified for you the decision makers they've um, uh, given you the specifications for what their requirements are. Um, the max coach can recommend to the rep as they're moving sales through the opportunity uh, cycle. These are the things that you should be looking to get done with the customer in order to enhance the, the potential for this sale to actually be realized. Next slide, please. 
So actually the next one is, is going to be the max demo. And uh, as I tee that up, there was a question that came through about price since we, you talked about price in midterm. Uh, maybe you could take this. Uh, so sure. the question is, how does this compare to other price guidance tools like Pros or Zillion? I'm not an expert on that, but I could certainly demonstrate uh, what we're talking about when we're saying price intelligence, price uh, optimization. So sure. uh, maybe you could start that off and, and I'll tee yeah. up the demo. Well, there's a, there's a key point, which is you can have pricing rules that say this is how you should price a product. You can also have predictive analytics that say, based on other data about the customer, uh, the customer demographics, here's the likelihood of this price being accepted by them. The machine learning goes one step further by saying, based on the predictive analytics and based on our pricing rules, this is what we think you should offer the price at. But it can also then learn from the, the pricing cycles that go on to say, we're now seeing you know, how these factors are impacting um, the customer uh, elasticity towards price. And based on those factors, we're making a recommendation as those sales go through the sales process and more data is gathered about how well or poorly um, the rep was able to execute against those that pricing guidance, it refines the gu guidance going forward. So the machine learning really is the icing on the cake to, to make those pricing recommendations, which primarily are predictive in terms of, of most systems, um, actually get better and better as time goes on. Okay, so let me start off with a, um, a demo of Max. And I think your last slide, Jack, in terms of talking about where you're headed with Max, obviously we're in the throes of activating Max at, at Walters Kluwer right now. Uh, but let me give a demo that, that kind of ties that last slide together. So I'm a seller, uh, I just got through a meeting with, with uh, Acme, which is my account. Uh, I, I'm pretty excited and jazzed. They asked for a, a quote. And so in this case, I'm, I'm going to be quoting some of Aptis's products, right? So the way to activate Max is just to say hi. And now what you notice that I'm using Skype. Skype is the a collaboration tool that we're using, but you can also be using something like a Slack uh, or, or SMS or our more appropriately MMS to, to, to get some of the richness of the graphics, right? So Max is saying hi to me here. And what I want to do is create a quote for Acme. And you might be thinking, what, what's the big deal here? I could do that in, in my uh, browser. But the thing is, what, what we're doing this is we're, we're doing this through conversations, right? So here, uh, I want to do a configure price quote quotation. So I hit two, I could have, you know, enter the whole thing, but uh, two was the best way to do this. And these are cards, so I, I can either quote a Sprint Enterprise or Ultimate, and I'm going to do Ultimate CPQ. And now Max, so this is where, where the assist guide and coach is starting to come in. You'll see how, how that construct of what Max is capable of doing uh, is, is coming together in this dialogue itself. So I'm going to say 100 full users. I'm going to say 50 read only and 5 super users. So because you know I use Max a lot, Max understands from my habits that I like to do a, a three-year deal. And so I'm going to say, yes, of course, Max, that's what I want to do. And by the way, that's probably the policy of the company as well. So Max can capture the rules of your company and, and just kind of exhibit that out and surface that out to the user as they're using it. So now she's putting together this, this uh, summary of what I just said, 100 full users, 50 read only, and five super users, and for a three-year period. And to Jack's point, uh, this is where Max is coming back. I've analyzed this account. I found that accounts like this and in this industry uh, buy Premier Support Plus. 
So here's a, a, a machine learning algorithm that's surfacing uh, cross-sell to me. And so what I want to say is, of course I want to do that because I'm benefiting from, from the, the knowledge of the previous users that have been successful. So now what she's going to do is go ahead and update the previous quote here with Premier support again for the 36 month period. And what you'll see here is that indeed happened. So as we move on this dialogue, uh, what's, what's coming up now is what about a discount? What should I be offering? Uh, I'm actually pretty excited for, to, to get Acme and secure Acme. So I'm going to be pretty aggressive here and say I want a 35% discount on this particular quote. Uh-oh. Well, Max says that, that this discount level is going to be pretty risky and I need to go through two levels of approval. Am I sure? Uh, no, I'm not actually sure. So what I can do is here I can ask um, Max for guidance, right? What, give me the deal guidance here. So what she'll do is just surface the swim lanes that I can, can uh, go across, right? So from what I'm seeing is from 0 to 15%, I don't need any approvals. Uh, 16 to 30, I'm going to need my manager. And obviously, you saw at that 35% level, I needed um, both my manager and the CEO's approval. But at this point in time, being new at all of this, and this is a new account for me, I'm just going to ask Max for um, her recommendation. What is what do you recommend? So here she comes back and gives me a recommendation of 15% discount. So the question of what is, you know, how are we doing pricing compared to other folks? Again, I don't have a good answer because I don't know their products. I'm not an expert on their products, but what I can tell you and what Jack has told you is that based upon our machine learning algorithm and, and tuning that for, for in, in Walter Schooler's case, Jack's case, uh, their, their particular need, and in our case, this particular need, we're able to surface uh, this discount level. This is the appropriate discount level to begin with. So she went ahead and she is generating this quote for me. and. I can open up this quote in my app, this instance. And what you'll see is this is a proposal for Acme. I had selected the ultimate CPQ with Premier support, 100 full access users, 50 read only, and five super users for this price. So great. I'm going to send this off to, to the um, Acme, and then I'm, I'm heading on the road. And as I'm heading on the road, I remember that my company is pretty anal about hygiene, CRM hygiene, right? My company wants me to make sure that I enter this particular opportunity as soon as possible. So I'm going to engage Max again. And in this case, I'm engaging Max to go ahead and update the opportunity or to create the opportunity in uh, my Salesforce instance. And Jack, I know for you, you want to be able to do this both um, at the same time, I guess in one flow. Maybe you could comment on that. Sure. Yeah. We, we want to make it seamless for the reps, whether they're typing into uh, Skype slash link or whether they're talking to their mobile device that they can have Max create an opportunity for them, have Max do some of the uncommon tasks for them, have Max provide recommendations to them um, as part of that flow. So uh, we're building it specifically so that the, the reps that have the larger accounts will have automation support at their fingertips however they wish to use it. And it's it's interesting that you know, in your approach, you you're creating an opportunity. But well, actually, yes, you're you're actually updating an opportunity that you've already created. And yes. you know, Max is asking which account. One of the things that you can do with that is just tie it back to you. Uh, 
you just met with ACME, therefore they're the higher probability one, so we'll just confirm that they're the one that you want. Right. So in this case, now, now Max is just going through the flow. This is, uh, this is part assist, this is part guidance, right? So I'm, I'm just following the, the, the prescription of what, what my company is telling me that I need to do to be, um, I guess, CRM hygienic, <laughs> if, if, if you will. And so, so she's asking me when I'm going to close this business. I want to be fairly aggressive and say that I can close it in the next three months. And, and I'm simply just going back and, and following uh, exactly what she says here. There's a bunch of choices that, that, um, that's being presented to me. I'm going to say I'm in, in approved stage right now. Not quite vendor of choice. I would love to be there, but not quite there. So last question. Um, I'm just going to put Acme. And that's it. I'm going to say no. I don't want to do anything else. I'm I'm on the road. I'm I'm ready to head to my next deal. And in this case, if you want a little encouragement, she's basically saying, "Don't mess up. You could go to club and you just get this one in." So so that very quickly, what I just showed is a combination of what you you talked about, Jack, in in your roadmap, right? The ability to quote. Uh, following simple guidance from, from Max, the ability to go in um, from the desktop, I did that, but then, then to be able to do that on mobile, right? So that's pretty powerful stuff. Absolutely. All right. So let's get our, uh, let's get you into um, closing up with best practices here. Sure. And, and these, I don't think, are a surprise to anybody who's, who's worked on major projects, you really have to define a clear business case for machine learning. And in Walters Kluwer's case, we identified, you know, we've got a gap in how reps can access data and understand data. We're going to do a step-by-step -step implementation. Step one, get them to where we can give them product recommendations. Step two, get them to where we can give them account white space analysis. Step three, get to where managers and directors can use that information for territory planning. And secondly, set clear expectations. Make sure that people understand that day one, you'll get what we hope are decent recommendations. But the longer we use the system, the more valuable those recommendations will be as the system learns. And um, so that also ties to socializing the value of machine learning so that other individuals, other groups, can understand that if they have challenges that can be addressed by artificial intelligence and machine learning, you want them to bring those to the table so that you can build the use cases and, and plan out how you can execute on that. And as I've said before, you want to extend this incrementally. You want to um, have a quick success and then move forward from there on larger and larger footprints for the application. And uh, as I said, Walters Kluwer is, is all in on the idea of artificial intelligence internal to our products. And we are all in on the, the idea of artificial intelligence to support our sales operations. So from there, I think we had a, a polling question for the group. Um, and this is, this is sure really, do. what challenges do you as a as a group see AI solving for you? Yeah, it'd be interesting, especially when fifty percent of you guys are already uh, implemented. I would really love to hear, uh, yeah, what what is it doing for you? And if uh, if it's other, if it's none of the above, it's not adoption, visibility, et cetera, uh, Please share with us in in the question uh, what what it is that you're you're using AI for. So we'll give it another uh, a few seconds here. Uh, one question that came in that maybe Jack you can help with is, what is the ROI for this investment? I.e., what is the relation of extra sales, cost savings versus the cost to build and deploy? Uh, that's a that's a good question. It, 
when we identified this as a potential solution, um, we actually said, you know, that the value of the rep's time and the value of the reps having the right recommendations at their fingertips was uh, uh, significant enough that we didn't build a formal ROI on this. And uh, so I, I don't have hard numbers yet. We're still working through. At the end of this year, we should be able to do some analysis on, you know, just how much additional incremental sales we've gotten out of it. Um, but I would say that anecdotally, you know, that the sales teams have said, this is adding value to my efforts. This is giving me um, insights that I would have had to spend time to develop. So, um, yeah, no hard answer for you yet, but I, I hope to have that in the near future. And that's a, it's an interesting poll response that we're seeing um, in that it's pretty much spread across the board, software adoption, uh, forecast visibility, and selling and then controlling discounting. Um, yeah, I mean, these are all classic uh, sales areas of concern, and mm -hmm. uh, it definitely lends itself to it from a sales operations perspective. Right. So I had a last question that, that I'll answer. Someone was asking if Max is available uh, in Salesforce Chatter, and the answer is no. Uh, Max is not available uh, for Salesforce Chatter. There's, uh, my understanding is there's, there's some architectural barrier that does not allow us to integrate uh, Max with, with Chatter. But we are, again, we are available uh, through SMS, MMS, if you will, uh, Slack or Skype or, or a collaboration tool of your choice. Uh, we recently added Microsoft Teams uh, into that as well. Um, do you have any closing thoughts? I don't. I think we answered most of the questions here. Well, I'd, I'd say that that it was a pretty easy sell for us to go to management and say, "This is an investment we think we may, we need to make, um, and here's how it can benefit the company in multiple ways." Um, as you saw from the the HBR study senior leadership is thinking about this very strongly. And if you can lay out the case for how you're going to leverage this, um, the why is usually not a question. It's, yeah, this makes sense. Let's let's move on it. Um, the thing that, that really drove it for me was the fact that with Aptus's focus on the quote to cash cycle, which is where, you know, revenue actually hits the bottom line, Applying machine learning and artificial intelligence in this area specifically um, really has a, a tremendous impact to the organization. Um, you know, if I was trying to do a broader AI implementation uh, across, you know, multiple apps or, or just in general across the Salesforce platform, they would be telling me the use cases are all around the sales process itself. Um, and so the fact that Aptus is so focused on how do we get the right quote to the right customer with the right price, that's, that just makes it a natural to look at the Aptus machine learning solution. Thanks for that closing thought, Jack. And I want to thank the audience for joining us. Uh, this was a wonderful webinar. Uh, until next time, thank you very much.